Um, hello, uh, good day. Uh, I am Engineer Lloyd Jan Stampa, and I will be uh, presenting to you here uh, a lesson, Fundamentals of Electronics One, specifically on the subject diodes and resistors. So uh, let's start. Let's try to know what are diodes and what are resistors in the field of electronics engineering. So to begin with, this, what you see in the pictures here, are examples of diodes. No? As you can see, uh, here's a ruler here. Uh, these are the usual length of diodes when you try to buy uh, one of any kind in the market. No? There are different forms of diodes. Now, diodes are semiconductor device. Semiconductor, which means that they have the characteristics with that of a conductor and with that of a insulator. Their main functions are typically switching. No, they do switching. And their other functions are rectification. What do you mean by rectification? Rectification is converting an AC signal into a usable DC signal. Uh, when you uh, circuits that are capable of rectification are called rectifiers. And also diodes also are capable of regulation, specifically voltage. No? Uh, these diodes, uh, their specific names capable of voltage regulation are called the uh, Zener diodes. So uh, let's go further. Uh, th these are the several types of semiconductor diodes. We have the diode rectifier or sometimes called junction diode, the Zener diode, the light emitting diode, photodiode, varactor diode, tunnel diode, avalanche diode, Schottky diode, temperature compensating diode, Silicon controlled rectifier, Shockley diode, pin diode, Peltier diode, gun diode, and laser diode. Okay, uh, as we know, laser stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So as you can see in this slide, uh, there are actually several types of diodes, but I'm I highlighted three here, uh, which we really need to know with this uh, presentation. Because uh, first thing is that these three are the mostly used uh, types of diodes in the electronic engineering industry. Again, these are the diode rectifier, the junction diode, Zener diode, and the light emitting diode. These other diodes can, uh, you might encounter this as you go along with other electronics engineering subjects, other major subjects now involving um, the use of other semiconductor devices and other related electronics engineering applications. So these are the forms if you if you want to look further what a certain diet looks like in the market or in the actual when you try to buy any form, you no? Know? It's the signal diodes, inner diodes, these are the tunnel diodes, gun diode, crystal diode. Varactor diode, constant current diode, okay, the light emitting diodes, IR LEDs, Schottky diode, pin diodes, avalanche diode, laser diodes, silicon controlled rectifier, photodiodes, transient voltage suppression diodes, step recovery diodes, super barrier diode, point contact diode, and Peltier diodes, and more, and many more. I think uh, as of the moment, uh, new new versions of these diodes are being manufactured and being improved in being improved in order to um, uh, further enhance their capabilities no uh, manufacturers may use uh, new technology uh, new materials uh, in the form of composites to strengthen the durability uh, the shelf life and uh, current ratings so whatever the need to improve uh, these diodes are being um, improve along the way through research and development with this uh, manufacturing electronic industries. Okay, so uh, these are the, some schematic symbol of diodes. Uh, if you see a letter A here, that's anode. Anode means um, the positive terminal. K stands for cathode, uh, signifying the negative terminal of the diode. So this is the generic form, the generic schematic symbol of a diode. This is the shot key. The Shockley, the constant current, the Zener diode, the light emitting diode, the photodiode, the step recovery, the tunnel diode, the varactor diode, and the pin diode. 
I think uh, you can really notice, no, uh, based on the illustration, they usually differ in this part, in this side, this is line. Because if it is just a simple uh, vertical line, if it's an ordinary diode, but in a Schottky diode, it's like this line becomes like a letter S, no? And the Shockley diode is like a special form. Now with a constant current diode, constant current diode, this line becomes like a capital letter I. And as we know, I is the uh, the symbol letter for current. For the Zener diode, it looks like a letter Z. And the light emitting diode is like there's a circle here and the arrows are like moving outward. The circle signifies that this diode is capable of producing light and capable of heating. No? So the difference between the light emitting diode and the photodiode is that the arrows in the photodiode are in or towards the diode, that their direction. But the light emitting diode, since it is emitting light, uh, it's outside, towards outside direction. And the step recovery diode is like a letter L. The tunnel diode is like this one, it's like, it's like the it's like a letter T in which you just put it in an horizontal formation. The varactor diode here is like there's varactor is like variable capacitor. Um, this symbol looks like the symbol of a capacitor, no? A two two plates, and the pin is like there's like a a rhombus here and a line. So as you can see, uh, it just shows that it's a family of diodes, and just by illustration, you can see that just by being familiar with their schematic symbols, it will automatically give you an idea like what kind of diodes are you looking in any given sheet or in the screen or in the schematic symbol or in a circuit itself. No? So I hope you, you familiarize yourselves with this uh, different schematic symbol for diodes. Okay? So uh, diodes are different types and has variations. No? From these different types, they are used in different types of circuits based on their solid state characteristics and special functions. And what do you mean by solid state? Solid state means circuits and devices are built entirely from solid materials. Now, sometimes that's, that is why we use the term solid state electronics. Solid state electronics because um, capabilities of these components are being in, enhanced based on their solid state characteristics or characteristics during their solid form, okay? And then electrons are electrons and other charge carriers are confined entirely within the solid material. So um, th there is this um, terminology that we usually use based on how we assess about the characteristic arrangement of the molecules or atoms of any given material. Like for example, if the atoms are arranged in an organized way, it's called crystalline. But if the atoms are arranged in an organized way, it's called amorphous. Now, you can actually research further about these terminologies between the difference between the crystalline and amorphous. And sometimes the solid state means is that the term is often used to contrast with the earlier technology of vacuum tubes and gas discharge tube devices. Uh, because uh, as you see, historically, uh, the solid state electronics terms uh, was used during the, the rise of the, the discovery of the transistors and the rise of the electronics industry. But when electronics is not, was not that um, popular yet, uh, the term the scientists, the technologies, and the engineers usually used are um, vacuum tubes and gas discharge devices, no? So that was in the past. But in the, with the rise of electronics engineering, they usually used the term solid state then. And then it became already a, like a mother tongue language when you say or when we describe electronics. So as you can see here, no, uh, this is a PCB with a uh, uh, transformer with capacitors. No, and we, we have an IC here, an integrated circuit. Uh, it's like a black chip, a rectangular black chip with some legs. And this is a transistor. This is, this is a light emitting diode. And at what you can see here, no, this is a very historical um, electronic component. This is the very first transistor. 
This is called the point contact transistor. No? So, uh, with, with this discovery, the use of vacuum tubes uh, began to deplete because um, uh, with this discovery, they realized that the invention of the transistor, um, it really boosted uh, the application and the use of um, electronics engineering components in the field of technological advancement in the industry. Okay, so uh, as you can see here, uh, this is a schematic symbol of an of an ordinary diode. Again, an anode anode means the positive terminal or the positive side of the terminal, and then cathode is the negative terminal or the negative side of the component. So this is an actual drawing of a uh, diode, no, uh, just being uh, simulated. But in reality, it really looks like this one. So the anode is in this part and the cathode is in this part. Okay. So as you can see, no, so this line is the cathode and this line is connected with the silver line. So as you can see, this silver line is the is the cathode. So whenever you look visually, okay, where, where is the positive side? Uh, where is the positive terminal? And where is the negative terminal? So as you can see, look for the silver strip. Automatically, you can say that that is the cathode. And you look for no sing, no silver strip that is the anode. Okay, so again, as as what this emoticon say, by visual inspection, the negative terminal is the one with the line strip. Okay, so try to familiarize this setup, especially if you're going to use diodes when you do breadboarding, when you put it in a printed circuit boards, or simply troubleshooting any circuits involving diodes. Okay, so. Uh, if you slice a diode, these are the two uh, types of materials being used. No, uh, the P-type materials and the N-type materials. Okay, the P-type materials are the majority carriers are holes, and for the N-type materials, the majority carriers are electrons. No, and this junction is called uh, the depletion region. Okay, again, it is because of this junction created by the P-type and N-type material, that is why it is called a junction diode. Because when you mix the P-type and the N-type material, a junction is created. Specifically, that junction is called depletion region. And that is also the reason why an ordinary uh, rectifier diode is sometimes called as a junction diode. Okay, so uh, with a conventional current, uh, as we know by theory, uh, conventional current is positive to negative and opposite to that is a reverse saturation current no uh, since since uh since it's a conventional current is the majority current here that moves in a clockwise direction the opposite current or sometimes called leakage current is called the reverse saturation current the, the conventional current here is the current with the movement of uh the majority carriers and the reverse saturation current is the movement of the minority carriers. Okay, so proceeding. So how to bias a given diode? We have a forward bias and a re reverse bias. So we have a diode here and also a diode here. And we have a battery, we have a battery. So in the forward bias, the negative at uh, the end type is connected to the negative part of the battery or the negative terminal and the P type part no, uh, is connected to the positive side of the battery. Or as we know, in this part, the P-type, this is where the anode is or the positive terminal. And the N-type, this is where the cathode is. Cathode is connected to the negative. So if you do this setup, diode conducts under its current flow. Okay? So diode conducts under its current flow. If you connect the positive terminal of the diode to the positive side of the battery and the negative side of the diode, to the negative terminal of the battery, okay? So what happens when we do the opposite? When you connect the anode, ano, when you connect the cathode to the positive side of the battery and you connect the anode to the negative side of the battery, it's called reverse bias. And when you do this, diode is open and no current flows, okay? So with this setup, this shows and this illustrates the capability of diode of either switching on, that means diode is conducting, or switching off, diode is open and no current flows. 
one of the basic function of any given diet. Okay? So let's proceed. So this is the diet characteristic curve. As you can see here, this is the origin. This is the current axis. The current axis, I, is the y-axis. And the voltage axis is this one, the x-axis. So where is the diode curve? This is the diode curve, no? This blue line. It looks like a, it's like, like a straight one and then a curve, and then a curve again, and then straight, and then a curve. So what do you mean by this part? No, a diode only conducts if its threshold voltage is surpassed by the supply. So as you can see, we can only get or generate current if you surpass this value of VD. VD here is means uh, the threshold voltage of a diode. Like for example, if a given diode has a threshold voltage of 0.7 volts, then that means in order for you to let this diode conduct, you have to make sure that you put forward bias into it and make sure that your voltage potential or the supply is greater than the threshold voltage of the diode. Like for example, the threshold voltage of the diode is 0.7 volts, then at least your potential should be at least 0.75 or 0.8 or 1 volt in order to really force the diode to conduct. Okay? So again, there should be two criteria in order for any diode to conduct. First is you, you need to use forward bias into it. And the second one is that your potential or your supply should be greater than the threshold voltage of the diode. Okay, so let's proceed. So how to check a good diode, no? Uh, because uh, during troubleshooting, you really have to use uh, the multi-tester to test whether a given diode is good or not. So how to do that? So if you, if you have any multi-tester, uh, as we know, the red probe is for connection in the anode or in the positive side, or sometimes it's called the positive probe. And then the black probe is sometimes called uh, the negative probe or should be connected to the negative side. No? So if you connect the red probe to the anode and the black probe to the cathode, uh, the, what you can see here is that diode is forward bias biometer and shows zero resistance. Ideally, if the diode is conducting, there should be no resistance no? because it is conducting. But if you do the reverse, if you connect the red probe, no? if you connect the red probe to the cathode or the negative terminal of the diode, and you connect the black probe to the, uh, the positive part of the diode, the positive uh, terminal, diode is reverse bias and it shows infinite resistance. Infinite resistance means the diode is not conducting, the diode is off. Um, zero resistance or very minimum resistance, that means the diode is uh, on and is conducting. Okay? So uh, you can actually use also a uh, uh, digital uh, multimeter to test that. No? Uh, if you put this red probe to the positive side and the black probe to the negative side, the diode is forward bias and measures about 1 kilo ohms resistance or almost no resistance at all. That means the diode is conducting. But if you do that, the black probe is connected to the positive terminal of the diode and the red probe is connected to the negative terminal of the diode, then that means the diode is reverse bias and there is high resistance or open circuit, which means the diode is not conducting. Again, there are keywords here. If the diode is conducting, it means uh, it's switch on or uh, it's... a it's a closed circuit. But when the diode is not conducting, it's called switch off or open circuit. Okay, so that's how to check a good diode. Okay, so these are examples of junction diode or rectifying diodes here. Uh, there are actually letters here and numbers. So let's explore. A rectifier diode, again, uh, a rectifier or circuits capable of rectifying and rectification means um, the process of converting an AC signal into DC signal, okay? So a rectifier diode is, is designed specifically for circuits that need to convert alternating current to direct current, no? Okay, so that is rectification by definition. And the most common rectifier diodes are identified by the model numbers 1N4001 through 1N4007. So these are the most uh, familiar 
or most popular uh, set of rectifier diodes used in any electronic circuits, no? the 1N series. And just a trivia, these diodes can pass currents of up to 1 ampere, and they have peak inverse voltage ratings that range from 50 to 1,000 volts. Okay. What do you mean by peak inverse voltage? With the, root, with the word inverse, that means that um, if you reverse bias a diode, the diode will really not conduct or will really, or will really not switch on. But with these higher ratings or higher application of voltages, there will come a time that the diode, even though it's not on because it's reverse bias, it, there will come a time that it will burn or it will short itself due to the magnitude of the reverse voltage being applied into it. That means when you, uh, is, when you hear the word peak inverse voltage with up to 50, let's say 50 volts, it means that the given diode with a 50 volts peak inverse voltage, if you apply 50 volts maximum, the diode will still not uh, turn on in a reverse bias way. But when you increase the peak inverse voltage rating from 50 to, let's say, 51 volts, and then you do that in a reverse bias way, what will happen to the diode is that instead of being open, it will burn and it will be shorted. Okay, so that's very dangerous, no? Uh, so as much as possible, try to use, di try to use diodes with, um, with relatively peak inverse voltage ratings that are high enough if in case that you will have to do the mistake of doing a reverse bias instead of usually using it in a forward bias way, okay? So that means uh, usually uh, manufacturers put um, very high peak inverse voltage rating for diodes uh, because uh, they might expect that the ones using these diodes might uh, develop a mistake or might do the mistake of um, reverse biasing the diode but not in the plan of using the circuit in that way. Okay, so uh, make sure to always check or to always put the diode in a forward bias way so that uh, there will be no complications when the circuit is being used. Okay? So uh, here is a list of the peak inverse voltage for each of the common diodes for the 1N4001, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So uh, as you can see here, the 1N4001 is capable of handling a 50 volt peak inverse voltage. Again, uh, the 1N4001 can handle a reverse bias voltage of 50 volts. But more than that, more than 50 volts, this 1N4001 will burn or will get shorted. And I think the, the one that can really handle reverse voltage without switching on is this one in VOR007, which is capable of not conducting even though the reverse voltage supply is already 1,000 volts. Okay, no? So when choosing one of these diodes for your circuit, pick one that has a PIV that's at least double the voltage you expect it to be exposed to. For most battery-powered circuits, the 50 volts PIV of the one in four 001 is more than sufficient, okay, uh, when you use battery in your design circuits. And most rectifier diodes have a forward voltage drop of about 0.7 volts. Thus, a minimum of 0.7 volt is required for current to flow through the diode. Okay, so that's, that's the use of a peak inverse voltage, no? Uh, protecting the diode, protecting the circuit. Like, even though it's already reverse bias, but the diode will still not conduct. But again, if the peak inverse voltage is is already um, surpassed by the supply, then the diode will burn. So always be careful of, of the PIV rating of the diodes, okay? So we have here signal diodes. Uh, let's see what's the difference between rectifier diodes and signal diodes. So these are the example of signal diodes, no? So a signal diode is designed, so these are example of signal diodes also, okay? A signal diode is designed for much smaller current loads than a rectifier diode and can typically handle about 100 milliampere or 200 milliampere of current. And the most commonly used signal diode is the 1N4148. Okay. And the diode has a close brother. Okay. So we have this term in electronics engineering or when you buy electronics engineering parts, electronics component is that 
if there if you're looking for a specific diode or a specific resistor, a specific capacitor, or let's say with this one, signal diodes, you want to uh, you want to uh, buy one N for one forty eight, but then there's out of stock uh, in the market. So what will you do? So we have this term brother, no? Like uh, this is not the actual signal diode that you're looking forward to use, but it is a brother that is also has a similar characteristics and capability of the diode you're looking for. So it's more like not a replacement, but a um, uh, uh, competent enough component, similar behaving similarly or functioning similarly to the diode you're trying to use. No, so if like for example, if uh, if there's no one in forty one forty eight, then you can use the one in nine one four. Because it can be used in its place if you can find a one N forty one forty eight. So you, with that, you use the term brother, no? With that, no? Uh, okay. So thus, this diode has a forward voltage drop of 0.7 and a peak inverse voltage of one hundred volts and can carry a maximum of two hundred milliamperes of current. Okay. So, so don't worry if one component is not available in the market. Try to ask the seller. Uh, do you have a brother? of this component that I'm looking for. And I think the seller would be more than happy to help you with that concern. Okay. So uh, this is the comparison no? of signal diodes and rectifying diodes. Signal diodes are smaller and are often made of glass and germanium rather than silicon. And they, have, they work better in higher frequency signals and are extensively used in rapid switching electronic circuits. Okay. So that means Signal diodes switches and uh, switch faster than rectifying diodes. Now, for the rectifying diodes, they are larger in terms of size and higher in terms of current rating and peak inverse voltage, and they are effective in low frequency signals. Okay, so as you can see here in application, signal diodes uh, switch faster than rectifying diodes, but they work better in high frequency signals. On the other hand, when you are speaking about low frequency signals application, use rectifying diodes. Okay, so there's no such thing as winner between these two. It just depends on the application of your uh, electronic circuit that you are designing or you are troubleshooting. So, what? Okay, we're, we move now to Zener diodes. These are examples of Zener diodes. No, uh, uh, they look like uh, kind of uh, spark plugs. No, uh, spark plugs in cars or any like automotive equipment, but as what you can see here, uh, these are Zener diodes. Okay, so what's special about these Zener diodes? Zener diodes is got their name because of Clarence Melvin Zener, who was an American physicist who first described the property concerning the breakdown of electrical insulators. No, so these are different forms, different phases of the Zener diode. But what makes them special? Their primary function is the one that I stated earlier okay that these zener diodes are capable of voltage regulation okay voltage regulation what do you mean by that um whenever there is an increase in voltage they will really regulate the whole circuit in order to protect the whole circuit or maintain a voltage level as expected by the design and if the signal diode and the rectifier diode will switch on if you do forward bias, well, what's well, what is special about um, Zener diodes is that their mode of operation is that they only switch on if you do reverse bias. Okay, so very interesting. They conduct it. They, they conduct if they are in reverse bias. No, so the PIV ratings of the Zener diode is called the Zener voltage. So let's explore more about this Zener diodes. Okay, so this is the characteristic graph of a Zener diode. No. So, as you can remember, this is the first quadrant, the second quadrant, the third quadrant, and the fourth quadrant. As you can remember, in ordinary diodes, in the form of junction diodes, uh, rectifier diodes, or uh, signal diodes, they work, they function in this first quadrant, no? But since Zener diodes only work if you do reverse bias, then they work in this region. So that's why... When you look in a diode graph, this third quadrant is sometimes called as the Zener breakdown region 
because it is in this area where the zener diodes are capable of conducting. Okay, so you can see here the uh, IZ, min, IZ min or the minimum zener current and the uh, IZ max or the maximum zener current. Okay, so we try to put that in mind. And these are the symbol of, uh, of a zener diode, no? Uh, just the same. Uh, it, it has the same uh, terminal with an ordinary diode. It has an anode, it has a cathode, but its symbol is that there's a letter Z. Z uh, in, in, its, uh, in its vertical line. Okay, so try to familiarize that one. So we now proceed with the light emitting diodes. Okay, so as you can see here, different colors like the light, the blue, uh, light green, dark green, yellow, and red. Uh, th th these are what's nice about light emitting diodes is that uh, they are famous because uh, they are the diodes. Who are very colorful, especially in application uh, lights. Uh, the lights they emit are very interesting to mix with, or, or to use as an indicator, to use as a um, to use as a part of a display, and depending on the application. So let's discover more about these light emitting diodes. Okay, so light emitting diodes are sometimes called LED is a very popular type of diodes capable of emitting light when turned on. Its primary purpose is as indicator, okay? As indicator, like, like for example, if you switch something and then there should be a visual indicator that you've switched on that device, okay? So try to remember, no? Uh, when you turn on your, when you turn on your, um, your computers, your laptops, usually on the right side or in the front side, you, you can see this small button no? Uh, indicating that uh, you've turned on that device. So those are, those are LEDs. Those are light-emitting diodes. No? Uh, they just uh, show that you turned on if they are on. And then when they are off, that means the equipment or the device is off. So that's just their basic um, function. Their basic fun function are as indicators, no? And other applications of this are that they are used for display lights and this decorative electrical visualization and effects. Okay, so there are different forms of uh, light emitting diodes. No, uh, these are the basic ones, but you can see that they have cheap versions and like this one, it's like a chain of different LEDs. So creativity is the key. Like how are you going to harness uh, the characteristic of these light emitting diodes in which uh, you may use it for indication, indicator purposes or for displays. And as you can see in the schematic symbols, this is the schematic symbol of a light emitting diode. No? Um, uh, these arrows pointing outwards indicates that uh, these diodes are emitting heat and that uh, they are also emitting light. Okay, so they... These light emitting diodes uh, function with a phenomenon called electroluminescence. No, it's an optical and electro electrical phenomenon which a material emits light in response to the passage of an electric current or a strong electric field. No, so when a LED is turned on, electrons are able to recombine with holes within the device, releasing energy in the form of photons. So um, I hope you get familiar with this term, electroluminescence. Because that's the phenomenon, like why we see that uh, a LED is turning on or turning off. And you can also see here, no, uh, different um, designs of LEDs. We have the, the simple one, uh, medium size. Then we have the flat, uh, the rounded one, and the clear one, the bigger ones. No? So there are actually different variety of LEDs, depend depending again with the use of how they will be used as um, indicators or as display, okay? So uh, how to know where is the anode part? Anode, where, where is the anode, the positive terminal? And where is the cathode part of a light emitting diode? No, cathode, anode, positive terminal, and cathode is the negative terminal. So as you can see here, in a, in a more detailed manner, these are the parts of a common LED, the epoxy lens, wire bond, reflective cavity, semiconductor die, the anvil, the post, the lead frame, the flat spot. Okay, so as you can see here, the positive one or the anode 
the positive terminal is the one that doesn't have the flat spot. Okay, so when you look in a lead, there is like a plastic circle encapsulating it, but the wire or the terminal aligned with the flat spot. Okay, there's a flat spot here. That is where the okay, flat spot here. Oh, that's where the cathode is. Or mostly, if, if you buy it in the market, the one with the longer length of the terminal is the positive terminal or the anode. And the one with the shorter leg is the cathode. And sometimes if you look, if you look inside, okay, so the cathode is connected to the one with like uh, an axe. An axe weapon inside, no? Uh, this is connected to the cathode. Yeah, it looks like, like an axe. And the anode or the positive terminal is like the sphere inside the inside this bulb. Okay, so uh, several ways, several visual indicators like how to know where is the positive terminal of a diode, of a light emitting diode. And where is the negative terminal of a light emitting diode? Okay, so uh, you can always uh, uh, study study more about this uh, setup, especially if uh, you're going to start buying light emitting diodes and using it in your circuits. Okay, and then you and then just by visual indication, you will know. Oh, okay, here is the positive part, and here is the negative part, or here is the positive terminal, and here is the negative terminal. So. Kindly explore, okay? So the longer terminal is the positive terminal and the neg negative terminal is the one under the flat spot. Okay, so try to familiarize that. Okay, so this is inside the light emitting diode, no? Uh, these are emitted light beams, diode, transparent plastic case, and the terminal pins, no? So this is what this is what's happening when you when when you forward bias this diode and then the electrical energy is uh, converted into light energy, and this is what uh, electroluminescence is happening. No, this is electroluminescence. No, so I'm just trying to show you here what is inside a common light emitting diode that you see in most um, in most appliances, in most um, electronic the electronic equipment. So that's it. Okay, so now we proceed with photodiodes. No, these are photodiodes. Photodiodes are uh, most of the time these photodiodes are very very small. No, and the symbol for photodiode is opposite to that of a light emitting diode because uh, light emitting diode is uh, the arrows are outward, but the photodiodes the arrows are inward. No, signifying that they react based on the amount of light that is being channeled into them. So these photodiodes no, have, has two modes of operation. It's either photoconductive, it can perform in reverse bias way uh, because uh, it is uh, at this part, uh, it is um, sampling and um, managing the photo current that it's, uh, it's uh, absorbing and generating along the way. And it can also be photovoltaic, a zero bias, a current withheld for voltage buildup. Now, the principle of operation of photodiode is that when a photon of sufficient energy strikes the diode, it excites an electron, thereby creating a free electron and a positively charged electron or hole. And this mechanism is also known as the inner photoelectric effect. Okay, now, so if the absorption in the conjunction's depletion region or one diffusion length away from it, these carriers are swept from the junction by the built-in electric field of the depletion region. Thus, Holes move toward the anode and electrons toward the cathode and the photocurrent is produced. So this photocurrent is the one being stated here. No? When, when, the diode, when this uh, photodiode is working in the photoconductive operation. And then the total current of the photodiode is the sum of the dark current or current that flows with or without light and the photocurrent. So the dark current must be minimized to maximize the sensitivity of the device. So too much theory about this. So let's see how these photodiodes are being used. So uh, this is the anatomy of the active pixel or sensor of photodiode. No? We have the micro lens, amplifier transistor, column bus transistor, silicon substrate, reset transistor, row select bus, potential well, and photodiode. But these 
are samples of photodiodes with those very, very small photodiodes. And we appreciate their application. What are, the, what are their application with these photodiodes? Their applications are those smart devices. Okay, so you remember if you play the game, your smart TV or your cell phone, like you do a, a slate of hand, okay? And then the TV reacts or the device reacts because in the frame itself of that, as, of that smartphone of yours, of that um, smart laptop of yours or smart TV of yours, uh, there's a photodiode, series of photodiodes in which uh, they react based on the amount of light being channeled into them. So that's why... Uh, there's no wonder that when you want to uh, alter the channel of a TV, then you just do a slate of hand. So actually what you're doing is that you are covering, you are disrupting the light um, being channeled with this group of um, uh, photodiodes. That's why they then react in the form of switching on to change the channel to adjust the volume or to react based on the smart uh, function or feature of your device. No? So typically, uh, smart TVs and smart cell phones have a variety of um, photodiodes. No? You, that's why you usually use the gestures of your hands. So that's how uh, photodiodes are used. Okay? So then... These are also other examples no, of photodiodes. No? Uh, we have the FGA20, FGA10. FGA05, FGA21, and FGA01FC. So, but as we are talking now, more and more of these, more and more versions of these diodes are being manufactured. Okay, so you can always explore with their use. Again, uh, photodiodes function based on the amount of light being channeled into them. And then when you control this amount of light by providing sudden darkness or illumination, they react based on how they are being programmed to with their uh with the circuit design okay so those that's it for photodiodes then we have this varactor diodes or varicap no? uh, let's see uh, how this uh type of diodes functions uh, commonly uh, these are some examples of them sot23 sot323 sod5 523 and SOD323. Okay? And, and then by visual inspection, these are examples of um, varicaps. So what are their main use? V varactors are used as voltage-controlled capacitors. Okay. Voltage-controlled capacitors. That's why, as you can see, the diode symbol itself has like a capacitor inside it. No? Because again, they act, act as voltage controlled capacitors no they are commonly used in uh, voltage controlled oscillators parametric amplifiers and frequency multipliers again their operation is the same with the uh, uh with the zener diode and uh, photodiode they are also operating in a reverse bias way the greater the reverse bias the lesser the capacitance and vice versa which means uh, the lesser the reverse bias, the higher the capacitance. So it works both ways. So it depends, again, on the designer, like how he or she is going to use this interesting capacity of uh, varactors or varactor diodes. No? So again, as VCOs or voltage-controlled oscillators, and these VCOs sometimes are used in FM, in our FM radios and Frequency modulation transmitters and phase lock loops. Phase lock loops are used for the frequency synthesizers that tune many radio, television sets, and cellular cellular telephones. Okay, so with this uh, with this um, application of varactor diodes, you know, like, like trying to incorporate capacitance during their switching on and switching off, is very very interesting. Like, how are we going to use these characteristics in designing better and improved circuits to create uh, better technology for in the field of electronics engineering? Okay, so that's very, very interesting. So I'm presenting to you here diode equivalent circuits. No, There are three forms of diode equivalent circuits. We have the ideal, we have the simplified, and we have the piecewise linear. The ideal diode is just one diode. Is in the setup, it's just one ideal diode. Then for the simplified, 
an ideal diode and its threshold voltage. No, like again, threshold voltage, uh, as, as you can remember, uh, the silicon diode has a 0.7 volts uh, threshold voltage, and the germanium diode has a 0 0.3. Uh, 0.3 volts threshold voltage. Okay, and with this part, the piecewise linear, it's like an ideal diode plus the threshold voltage and then the bulk resistance. The bulk resistance is uh, the natural body resistance of the diode. No, uh, it, it's always there. No, so the the simple anal analysis we use the ideal equivalent circuit. In a in an average analysis, you use the diodes ideal setup plus its threshold voltage and the real analysis is that you already consider also the bulk resistance of the diode but typically in analyzing um, electronic or electrical circuits the simplified one is the one usually used okay so please take note of that and we have this um, general diode equation so kind of um, you don't need to memorize this uh, unless you unless you're already uh, will be having a quiz no but what i'm trying to present here is that this is the general diode equation for you to be familiar with and what you do with this it's a formula so you can only use this by way of simple substitution so id here is the diode current is is the reverse saturation current k here is Counted as 11,600 11, divided by N, where N is 1 for germanium and 2 for silicon. Okay? And then TK here, TK is the absolute temperature. As we know, absolute temperature can be expressed in Kelvin or Rankine. But usually, we use the Kelvin. That, that means when you have the degree centigrade, you have to add 273.15, and that is the absolute temperature. And VD here is the applied potential. Okay? So... Uh, what you, in problems involving diode calculations, you usually do simple substitution based on what is given in the problem. Okay, so take note of that. And in a diode, diode resistance levels, we have the DC or static resistance. We have this, the, the diode resistance is equal to VD over ID or the diode voltage and the diode current. AC or dynamic resistance, we have this uh, RD, like a small letter R. Because usually in AC analysis, uh, we know that it is AC analysis if the variables being used are, are, are lowercase. No? And then if it's DC analysis, the variables being used are uppercase. Okay, so RD here is 26 millivolt. It's a constant value over the diode current. And the average AC resistance is like, the, it's like AC, analysis, AC analysis again. The average is equal to delta or the change in diode voltage over the change in diode current. But usually what, what we do, uh, like for example, in electronics one, you use the this formula. And in electronics two, in AC analysis, you use this formula. Okay, so I'm presenting this to you for you to be familiar with. Okay, so some now we now proceed some with some practical applications of diodes. The practical applications of diodes are the following. Okay, we have nine uh, um, core applications of diodes. First is rectification, protective configuration, polarity insurance, controlled battery powered backup, polarity detector, um, offering longer life and durability, setting voltage reference levels, establishing a level, a voltage level sensitive to the load current and AC regulator and square wave generator. Okay, so let, let's try to explore uh, what are their specific examples so that we appreciate better these practical applications of diodes. Okay, so start, to start with, I'm presenting to you here an example of a power supply circuit. Okay, so what we're looking forward here is the rectification. It's converting an AC signal into a DC signal in applied and power supply circuits. So there are diodes here. Diode, no? it's a light emitting diode, light emitting diode, okay? And we also have this formation of diodes here. This bridge formation of the diode is the one that is capable of converting the, the AC signal coming from the transformer 
And with this AC signal or AC voltage signal coming from the transformer, if it passes with this bridge type formation of the four diodes, eventually what comes out as an output in this part is already a DC signal. Okay? So what comes from a transformer, uh, because transformer is capable of stepping down or stepping up a supply voltage. So let's say the supply here is 220 volts, and then we have a 1212 or 12, 12 step down transformer. So from 220 volts AC, it is being stepped down to 12 volts uh, AC. And when this 12 volts AC, as it passes with this bridge type formation of the diode, what comes out here is already a DC voltage. So that's how rectification works. No? Rectification work, uh, the basic use of uh, junction diodes and rectifier diodes, converting an AC signal into usable DC signal. Okay, so okay, just a reminder, uh, what we need to use with our electronic equipment and appliances should be DC and not AC. So our supply in the outlets are in the form of AC. So this needs to be translated into DC in order for this voltage potential to be used and harnessed by the appliances or our electronic equipment or electrical equipment. And the one way to do that is that we have to rectify the signal. And thank you. Thank you for, the, for these uh, diodes because they are the ones capable of doing that, converting the AC signal into usable DC signal. Okay? So... Protective configuration here. So this this are uh, this is a setup of, about uh, it's like uh, we have a, a differential amplifier here and uh, an amplifier in this part. So what I'm trying to show to you here is this one as a protective configuration. It's protecting a sensitive circuit from possible damages like transients and arcing that is produced by the coils during the energizing process. Coil, this one, this is an inductor or a coil. A coil is energized or de-energized, and then What's dangerous about the energy uh, being that can be channeled from these coils is that there should there should be a protective device in order for that energy to not go to sensitive components like this um, transistor here, this or in that area where it will go back to the transformer part and there's a capacitor. So in order to protect the whole circuit from the powerful transients and arcing of these coils, then you should put a directional diode there. In order for these uh, coils um, chance of destroying the whole circuit to be minimal or to be zero, that it will not really happen. No? So you have to protect the circuit. So if there's a coil, always parallel a diode with that, a directional diode in order to protect the whole circuit. Okay? So this, this is an example of a clap switch. And clap, clap switch usually uses uh, coils to energize and de-energize in order to either turn, turn on the switch or turn off the switch. And this sudden burst of currents or sometimes called transients are capable of arcing. What do you mean by arcing? Uh, like, like you see in movies, like the sudden coil sudden visual um a visual um lighting of like a line of a charge it's called arcing and that's very dangerous for sensitive circuits no so again thank you for diodes for protecting the circuit with that how about this one polarity insurance no so what you see in polarity insurance this diode is protecting this um um sensitive circuit or uh or a very expensive circuit that doesn't need to be destroyed. So you have to put a protecting diode here. In order for you that, when a six, like for example, when a 16 volt supply is channeled, the diode is open, okay? So, it, so, if the, so if the 16 volt supply is channeled, the diode is open, but the diode then is conducting if there is the reverse, if there is the reverse bias supply. Again, no? Huh? This 12 volt system can only per, can only operate if you put forward bias into it. Like for example, the value is 16 volts. So if you put the positive uh, terminal of the supply 
let's say it's a battery to the positive side of the system, then the diode is not conducting. At least, uh, at least it's a normal operation. But if you do the mistake of doing a reverse bias, then the diode protects the system by forcing all the current to flow into it. Because since it is conducting, then all the all current will be channeled towards this diode and not through this uh, not through this uh, very expensive circuit. And then since it's 0.7 volts, 0.7 volt is not capable of turning on this 12 volt system. Okay, so that's quite, it's protecting a sensitive or quite expensive circuit from electrical damage due to wrong application of the polarities of the source or supply or wrong biasing. So that's how diode works. Okay, so at least the circuit is safe. How about this one? No, it can also be used as controlled battery powered backup, no backup power source to ensure that the system will still be operational in case of a loss of power. So, as you can see here, this autom automobile electrical system with 12 volts, this car radio uses diode formation in order for it that if suddenly there, there is um, the battery is, uh, is already not delivering enough um, current or voltage, then at least with this setup of car radio, you can still use it as a backup to ensure that the system will still be operational. Okay, so actually we, we, actually we cannot open it directly in internal electronics of a car, but they are actually strategizing the use of diodes to uh, backup the system. Okay, so that's the use of these diodes, no? Uh, we have a battery here and two diodes. With this setup, it's more than, than enough to be a battery-powered backup system. Okay? So it can also be used as a polarity detector, no? Why not we use LEDs? Using LEDs of different colors, this simple network can be used to check the polarity at any point in a DC network. So what if this we are going to use this one? Okay? So we can see here, that we have LED 1 and we have LED 2. So LED 1 will glow if positive polarity is in point A, this one, and negative polarity is in point B. Okay? Okay? Because LED 1 is forward bias if the positive part is connected to A and the negative part is connected to B. No? Because this is the anode and this is the cathode. But LED 2 or the red one will glow if positive polarity is in point B, the opposite, and the negative polarity is in point A. So that's as simple as that. No? Okay, uh, you, you try to design that the green will light if it, the positive is in A, and the red will light if the positive is in B. So as simple as that, we can always use the diode as polarity detector. Okay? So it offers also longer life and durability, no? uh, as you can Remember, uh, before LEDs were invented, most of our um, electrical light bulbs are usually fluorescent no? and incandescent bulbs. But when diodes, uh, no, but when light emitting diodes are, are, are being um, improved and these were being replaced, no? I think you can affirm with me that most of your uh, light bulbs in, in the house right now are using LEDs because LEDs offer longer life and durability. Okay, and so that's why most electronic gadgets and appliances today use LEDs since they offer, again, longer life. So it's, uh, it's cheaper and I think it's more environment friendly to use LEDs. So Try to use LEDs in your house and try to maximize its uh, usefulness. And also, it can be also be used as setting voltage reference levels. No, You can connect diodes in such a way that you can use different voltage levels as reference. Like, for example, we're going to measure this one using the multi-tester. We can see that 0.7 volts plus 0.7 volts plus 6 volts from the Zener, that would be equal to 7.4 volts. No, So you can actually strategically, you can actually strategically arrange this um, diodes in order to set up a voltage reference. And with that, like for example, this one, 6 volts and 0.7, you add that 
two, we get 6.7 volts. And you can use a circuit here that needs 6.7 volts. And also, if you simply use voltage regulation, you use the 6 volt zener. So it depends, no? Just by the formation of these diodes, you can, act, you can just add them and then set a voltage level and connect an additional circuit utilizing these specific values as their voltage reference levels. Okay? So those are voltage reference levels for diodes. So actually, it is very interesting to how to, to mathematically um, use these levels to be used for other circuits. Okay, next. So establishing now a voltage level in, insensitive to the load current. For example, you have an 8-volt supply, but this circuit here or the load here only needs 6.3 volts. So what are we going to do in order to make sure that only 6.3 volts is being channeled to the load? Okay, so maybe we can do this. 8 volts, no? And... Eight, how much the voltage drop of a silicon? The voltage drop of a silicon or its threshold voltage is 0.7. This one also is 0.7. And this one is 0.3. So you add that one, 0.7 plus 0.7 is 1.4 plus 0.3 is 1.7. So that means 8 minus 1.7 equals 6.3. Problem solved. Okay. You take advantage of the voltage drop or the inherent threshold voltages of diodes, put it, put them or connect them in series, and automatically from 8 volts, you make sure that from this point, only 6.3 volt is being channeled to the load. Problem solved. Okay. So again, you can also use diodes as AC regulator and square wave generator. No? With this setup, you have a resistor here, an AC signal, and then you put a Zener diode here it is capable of creating this waveform. No? The clipping here is called the regulation. Regulation, which means that whatever happens, even though the voltage is very, very high or the voltage signal is very high, the Zener diode will really clip, will clip this, uh, will clip this uh, voltage level uniform to its Zener voltage. And you can also set up with this style and at least the wave becomes like this. There is clipping in the positive side and there is clipping in the negative side. So the diodes are very much capable you know, of clipping waveforms and regulating it. You know? So that's why they are also used in AC regulators and square wave generators. So again, it depends on the application of the electronic circuit that we're trying to uh, design for a specific application. Okay, so... Um, that's, that's all about diodes, no? And again, if you have some concerns like, okay, what are other um, interesting applications of the diodes, you can always do research, no? Uh, then you can also watch um, some instructional videos like in uh, YouTube or How Stuff Works or uh, Khan Academy. Like, um, there are really several interesting use of diodes. So just try to... Um, satisfy that hunger of yours in exploring more um, more ways on how to use diodes in designing circuits. Okay?